um, uh, we will have Anand Tamboli who will talk uh, with us about like actually the technology ethics, which is a really important topic that actually our keynote speaker, opening keynote speaker Mark Boyd uh, uh, um, uh, leveraged in his presentation and, and we'd be glad to uh, end the, 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 the conference with, uh, with this topic. So Anand, how are you? I'm doing good. Just give me a second. Uh, we'll be... Yeah, you've just been disconnected. You will probably reconnect directly uh, there. Yeah, Hanan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, can you see me, though? We don't. We can't see you. We just see a gray we screen. Can't. Oh, give me a second, please. What What went wrong? It was working twenty minutes ago, so it will. It will work at some point. So next speaker is Anand Tamboli about solving the maze of technology ethics, right? With APIs and, and the, the the next speaker that will be me about all of what I've seen in API conferences and all, all the insiders information I get about what's happening in the industry or in the in the API economy, as I often say. I will share with you the challenges of the API economy for the next 10 years, right? And what I think. Yeah, hello, Anand. Perfect, we can see hello. you. We can see you really well. Uh, yeah, the stage is yours uh, for 25 minutes. We're really Perfect. Done. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I should say good morning uh, or good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are. Uh, this is early morning, Sydney. And today I'm going to talk about uh, solving the maze of technology ethics. I'm, a, uh, I'm recently appointed as a reviewer for uh, Springer Nature's uh, AI Ethics Journal. I also work with uh, AI Australia as a principal advisor, and I also have a consulting practice running along the side. And uh, every day uh, I come across AI technology use and technology related challenges. So today I wanted to talk about this, uh, how to solve the maze of technology ethics but really when i thought about the topic as to what i'm really addressing here the the real challenge is we are not talking about ai ethics per se or ethical ai we are not even talking about responsible ai or tech ethics what i'm really talking about here is being considerate being considerate because we as a developers or technologists working in technology domain in API and any other industry, we have a power to change. You have the power to change. And that's where uh, this journey begins. But let me share a story with you, a story from my childhood. So when I was uh, about 10 years age, I was quite marveled with the cars, how they how they transport you from one place to other. And I couldn't get as to how someone would be able to control the car just with the steering wheel because I didn't know anything else as to what's going on. So I asked my dad about how that works. And he told me about the other aspects of the car such as accelerator, brake and clutch. And as it continued, I had a one last question. Why do we need brakes? Don't they slow down the car? And then he answered that question with a very profound statement. He told me that brakes in the car, the function is to slow it down, but the purpose is to let it go faster. Think again, brakes in the car, they don't slow you down, they let the car go faster. And that's the key to remember. You see, we have been, uh, using technology in a very different way since past many years. And uh, there have been number of challenges with it in terms of how technology has broken number of things. Move fast, break things have been uh, quite a motto for technological developments. 
And unfortunately, it doesn't really help. A lot of people have thought that having a corporate governance, quality policies, number of other such things can actually be helpful. But then again, just having the policy is not going to be helpful. You see, API ecosystem is contributing into exponential change. Every single time you develop an API, it creates opportunities for number of APIs to connect and then go further, advance that at a very large scale, exponential scale, so to speak. And so in order to do that, we need to develop every product in a sustainable manner, every product in a right way, every product that you will be proud of after a number of years when you look back. Not that something you want to break because it is not working the way it is supposed to, and there are unintended consequences. And then if you want to really develop such kind of a sustainable and great product, it needs to satisfy at least three criteria. The first criteria essentially is it needs to do the right thing. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? It needs to do the right thing, and I believe we all want to do the right thing. And that's not even the topic of conversation today because that's in itself is a very big topic. But the second thing that uh, it needs to cover is if you are doing the right thing, you must do it right. And that's, again, obvious thing. And last two days you have spent in learning that, in learning how to do it right, how to develop API, API ecosystem, architecture, do it right, what are the best practices, etc. But the third part, which is covering all the risks, risk, unintended consequences, and other issues. That part is often missed. Lots of organizations think that having some kind of a quality policy, having some kind of a business risk management function is useful, or project risk management is useful, but that's half-hearted approach. That approach really doesn't help because again, just having policies is not going to be helpful. You need something that is practical. You need something that people can apply in their day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day work. Developers, team leaders, project managers, they need to be able to do something with it. Just having a guideline, not gonna help. Remember, when uh, we had money laundering cases, lots of criminal activities going on, and we always cribbed at the banks, saying that banks do not have sufficient measures in place to prevent that. So we blame banks, not just the criminals. And I think with API economy growing that fast and we adding to the exponential change, it is upon us to have those measures in place. It is incumbent upon us to have those measures in place. And to do that, I think we need to start with the design itself not as a post facto or after the fact approach. We need to start embedding those things, those frameworks from the beginning, from the design state. And one such a framework I want to introduce is pre-mortem analysis. I have discussed this framework at length in one of my books called Keeping Your AI Under Control, but I'll give you a bit of a rundown on that today. And the pre-mortem analysis is hypothetical opposite of postmodern analysis. So with the postmodern, what we essentially do is something has gone wrong, someone is already gone and lying on the table, we look at it and say, hey, what happened? Let's see why it happened. That's too late. Premodern is on the contrary, right at the design stage, right in the deployment or uh, development stage, we go through those processes, we go through those steps of the design, intended, unintended consequences, we think about those consequences and see how we measure against those and what kind of risk we need to manage. Let me give you an example. Say in case of an AI development, the process works much like this. It has got six stages. So we start with the design. There is a training data that comes in so the design model is trained on this data. That then gets developed and deployed in the field. And then this deployment is gets used. Once the usage starts, you start to get the feedback and that feedback goes back into the loop. And this is how the AI system, the machine learning models, et cetera, works. 
Now, pre-mortem can be applied in any of these stages, in all the stages of this AI development, design development and usage life cycle. So if you are designing a say chatbot, for instance, in the stage of design, you need to think what stages, what things this chatbot is gonna do, what are its function, what are its features, who is the user, how the user is gonna interact, everything. And then you ask questions as to what could go wrong, what consequence this might result into. And then you ask further in terms of these three main aspects, severity, occurrence, and detection. So what could go wrong and how bad that could be? What's the severity? Is it less bad as in one or is it extremely bad or hazardous or lethal as in 10? If that happens, why would that happen? What is the root cause of that failure? And how often this root cause is going to occur? How often this failure is going to occur? That's about the occurrence. So if it occurs rarely, you point one. If it occurs frequently, too frequently, that gets 10 point. With the detection, although it's slightly different. When we talk about detection, we are talking about if something really goes wrong, are you able to detect it so that you can fix it? And which is why you will see the scale is reversed. Earlier you detect, better it is. And the risk priority for that particular stage, for that particular function, or uh, for that particular feature is essentially the multiplication of severity, occurrence, and detection. I have written a lot in detail about this topic and you see the link below. If you go there, you will be able to see full details of how the pre-mortem analysis works. You will have a template to download, which is easy to use, and you can apply in the real life, apply in your development, apply in your projects. That's the key. Because unless you are deploying, unless you are applying something, any guideline, any quality policy, any risk management, any ethical policy, unless you are applying, you cannot be sure, you cannot be confident. When you measure something, you are able to control it. That's when you become quietly confident. And that's what we want to do, right? And now there's one common question I often get. That question is, hey, if I start doing all this, if I start being measured, being risk averse, wouldn't that slow down? Wouldn't that slow down my innovation? Wouldn't that stifle it? And I would like to ask only one question in that case. Brakes in the car, don't slow you down, they let you go faster. Do you think this is gonna slow you down? I don't think so. So remember gents, any organization that has got a high ethical capacity in the future, in coming future and onwards, will have a great future. And that's what you want to build. Because remember, there are a number of banks, but only a few banks have got a good reputation. And there is a reason for it. So here's my thing. It is upon us to basically build a product, build an ecosystem that is great, that is sustainable, so that when we look back after a number of years, we will be proud of that we did a good job. We were considerate. That's the key here because technology, like it or not, it brings us two things every time we develop new one. It gives us a promise, promise of prosperity, promise of good change, good life. But it also gives us consequences. And it is the consequences that we need to be thoughtful about, that we need to be responsible for, and that we need to be considerate about. And that's the key message here, to be considerate. Because ultimately, you have the power. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I would like to take some questions now. Yeah, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you uh, for, uh, for, for, for this great talk. I love the analogy of the brake that enables you to actually accelerate because you know you will be able uh, to brake. Uh, so recently, OpenAI just opened you know, their uh, their, um, I don't know, what they call it G, GT, whatever, three, uh, uh, you know, GT that, degree. yeah, yeah, so that, that's it. 
And actually, OpenAI is kind of try to, they don't try to put the brakes. They try to show a different kind of accelerator at some point. I don't know exactly how do, how do you explain that. But what mm -hmm. do you think into these, uh, let's, these, um, these other strategies to develop technology in a, in, a, in a different path, right? How do you see that kind of strategy instead of just regulate? Like the nudge, so the, nudge versus the, the nudge versus the regulation. Yeah, so that's always the race. You see, the, the regulation is always catching up. Uh, it takes a lot of time to get the consensus and then uh, get the policy developed. And I think, although it is worthwhile doing it, but that's really not going to help the way, or the, the speed at which technology works. So it is really, uh, I think, not useful to look up to uh, politicians or uh, lawmakers or policymakers to do something about it. We have to take charge. We have to do something about it. And that's where I say that you have the power. We have the power. So yeah, we have the power as as, a, as consumers and, and users, but also, uh, do you think also we need like a new way to democratize the understanding of technology or democratize the application of the regulations? And in that case, do we need to mix regulation and, and software to democratize it and make it cheap? Because now, just an example with data regulations, it um, yeah, you you need to almost have a lawyer to do the whole thing, you uh, you know and protect your rights and ask for your rights at some point if it will be scaled with a kind of a technology or software that make it one click it would be democratized democratized right so how do you see this uh, uh, technology versus regulation or technology uh, powering regulation enforcement so one of the challenges i see with technology and regulation uh, working together is you see, we, we often look at only early adopters as a technologist. We see that, okay, early adopters, how they respond, and if they're responding well, then we think that it's working just fine. But the real problem comes with wave two or wave three users. Like for instance, mobile phones were, were the great example. They were, they were great to use, and even now uh, they help, uh, they make our life easier. But as the technology democratized, as more and more people had access to it, even uh, bad actors had access to it. Satellite phones, we know terrorists use a number of other bad actors use it. And that's where the wave two, wave three people, uh, wave, through, uh, wave two or wave three adapters uh, really create that challenge. Now, uh, if we look at regulators to uh, do that, I think they would be able to do it, but uh, they won't be able to do it in time. And they can't convey that to us either in an effective manner. So somewhere this communication gap, uh, I think it's a, a very wide gap to be fixed. So someone has to take initiatives, either it is an industry body, industry uh, neutral body, uh, that, that's gonna take that stance and say, bridge that gap as soon as possible. Oh, and, and then uh, again, developers uh, ecosystem from our side, we have to take those strides to proactively approach regulators to do that. And, and to your mind, uh, which part of the world is currently the most aware of, uh, let's say, technology ethics? A lot of people are talking about technology ethics. In fact, uh, Canada started uh, uh, developing that policy in 2016. And just the recent news, I think uh, it came, out, came in yesterday about New Zealand uh, making it official that no, uh, at least government spending on algorithms would be, uh, they would be careful. They have uh, laid down a very detailed policy as to what government can spend on or cannot spend on. Okay, so, so really like a two diagonally opposite countries. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I totally uh, understand. So government money will fund one technology or the other depending on the ethics behind it, right? Yes. Yep. Also in the in the ethics, uh, uh, how do you see, let's say, in in the in the industry uh, uh, about uh, everything about environment? Because you talked about AI and rights, and, and and that was great. But how do you see also the environment and the uh, and the, let's say the planet ethics into into the discussions? 
Uh, unfortunately, that is not yet into the discussion because we, we are so uh, in the far end of it. Like, for instance, a lot of a lot of us talk about machine learning and uh, all those things, but how many people really know that how much computational power and so the electrical power is required for every algorithm to be trained on? And uh, that that knowledge gap itself is is the main problem. So unless we don't know what we are really causing, and which is why I use the word unintended consequences. Uh, Nobody wants to do something wrong by uh, fellow humans just for the sake of it, unless you're extremists. But uh, just making people aware that what are the consequences, third degree, uh, second degree and third degree consequences, uh, is something which is lacking. And uh, this is the high time we need to start doing it. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and I really remember from your message that we are part of the solution and when we like we are the solution at some point uh, of all what we consume, at least we have to know uh, actually what's going on. Hi, Anand, are you still hearing me? Uh, yeah, now I can hear you. I, I lost your previous. Uh, now, now I was just saying that. Yeah, business. yeah. Your main message is that we are the solution. We are part of the solution, and uh, yeah, at least yeah. With days we try to to give you like the, the opportunity to tell us that and so we can uh, apply it. Yes, definitely. We, I mean, uh, we can look up to people to basically give us the solution that may come, may not come. Uh, it always starts with us. We, unless we start, I think uh, we can't expect others to help as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Anand. Thank you, we'll be glad to invite you to other API days to, uh, to spread the, the word. Thank you. Thank you, Mehdi. Thank you, everyone.